After spending seven days in orbit around the Earth, the Space Shuttle Orbiter now faces arguably the most difficult portion of its mission, a hell-blazing journey through the Earth's upper atmosphere. Here, it will travel so fast that it will rip air molecules apart, forming a layer of superheated plasma around the aircraft. Re-entry is where the Space Shuttle truly became a one-of-a-kind spacecraft. The Space Shuttle was a radical new idea, a spacecraft capable of not only surviving the immense heat of re-entry but also transitioning to aerodynamic flight, which required the careful molding of its wings and tail, balancing the needs of an unpowered glider with those of a re-entry vehicle. This is the insane engineering of the re-entry. The re-entry procedure begins with a 2-4 to four minute burn of the orbital maneuvering system, OMS, engines while the space shuttle is upside down and traveling backward. With an orbital speed of around 7 km per second, the OMS pods need to reduce the orbiter's speed by just 0.1 km per second, 1.3% of its velocity, to lower its orbit enough to bring it into a collision course with the Earth's upper atmosphere. This is a precise maneuver, bleed too little speed and the orbiter will overshoot its narrow window for success, skimming through the thin upper atmosphere and potentially bouncing back into space. Bleed too much speed and the orbiter will descend through the atmosphere too fast, reaching the thick lower atmosphere before enough speed has been leached away, resulting in catastrophic overheating. This narrow entry window was called the entry flight corridor. Once the delicate retrofiring sequence is completed, the next phase of re-entry begins. The reaction control system flips the shuttle around and places it into a 40-degree upward pitch angle, ready to meet the Earth's atmosphere. Entering the upper atmosphere at 30 times the speed of sound, the speed is so great that it begins to rip air molecules apart, creating a glowing cloud of charged plasma around the lower surface of the orbiter, with peak temperatures reaching 1,650 degrees Celsius, 3,000 F. Nothing like this had ever been attempted. A blunt body capsule, like every other re-entry capsule to date, designed purely for thermal protection, is an engineering challenge, but adding the needs of an aircraft makes the task vastly more difficult. Thankfully, NASA had a test run in 1959 with the X-15, the fastest plane in the history of humankind, which advanced our understanding of hypersonic flight and provided many lessons that were incorporated into the Space Shuttle's design. However, the X-15 had one major advantage over the Space Shuttle, it didn't need to launch itself into orbit. It didn't even launch from the ground but instead from the belly of AB-52. This allowed the X-15 to use a state-of-the-art advanced heat-resistant aerospace metal, Inconel X, with a maximum operating temperature of 980 degrees Celsius, 1800 F. The space shuttle could not use this metal because Inconel X is too heavy, about 180% heavier than an equivalent aluminum airframe, a massive issue for an aircraft designed to be carried into orbit. The space shuttle's airframe, therefore, is not made from Inconel X but is composed of lightweight aluminum, which has a maximum operating temperature of just 177 degrees Celsius, five times lower than Inconel X. The orbiter would experience temperatures ten times greater than this for extended periods of its re-entry flight. To make matters worse, one of the principal lessons learned during the X-15 program was that the hot pink foam ablative coating sprayed onto the plane for top speed flights was completely unsuitable for the space shuttle. An ablative coating is a sacrificial material designed to gradually burn and fall away from the aircraft, pulling the heat away with it. However, the ablative coating of the X-15 had a nasty habit of burning away from the nose of the plane and attaching itself to the cockpit windows, rendering the pilots completely blind. This presented a bit of a problem. At one point, the engineers of the X-15 considered attaching a small explosive to the window and intentionally exploding the outer pane of glass to remove the ablative-stained window, leaving only the inner pane for landing. Thankfully, they came up with a much less risky solution of installing a mechanical eyelid to the left window that remained closed until the high-speed portion of the flight concluded, providing the pilot with one clean window to land with. An extremely primitive solution that created stability issues as the open eyelid acted like a canard, causing the plane to pitch up, roll right, and you're right. Even more terrifyingly, this coating became explosive when mixed with liquid oxygen and could be triggered by even a slight impact, a massive safety concern for a plane that required a liquid oxygen oxidizer to operate. This danger would be multiplied many times over with a vehicle filled with half a million liters of liquid oxygen. The ablative coating was also not reusable, which would drastically increase the cost of refurbishing the shuttle between flights. The space shuttle needed to be better. 
As the space shuttle descended through the atmosphere, its nose and wings bore the brunt of the re-entry heat. The high-pressure shock waves forming around them created a layer of superheated plasma. If this heat managed to find its way into the delicate aluminum framework inside the orbiter, it would be game over. This is exactly what happened to the Columbia shuttle as a result of damage to the leading edge of its wings. The first step to protect the orbiter's surface was to keep this superheated plasma as far away from the surface as possible. The nose, wings, and belly of the orbiter were carefully crafted to ensure shockwaves were kept at bay. Using Schleier and imaging, we can see how a pointed missile-like vehicle pierces through the air with efficiency, creating a shockwave attached to its nose at an angle determined by its Mach number. This shockwave is simply a region of incredibly high pressure, and with that pressure comes incredibly high temperatures. This can have disastrous effects, as DARPA experienced twice in 2010 and 2011 when testing their sharp-nosed hypersonic reentry vehicle, the HTV-2. Within nine minutes of re-entering Earth's atmosphere, both vehicles disintegrated as a result of the 1930-degree heat penetrating their metallic skin. The HTV-2 completed its mission of collecting hypersonic flight data, but the space shuttle needed to not only survive this mode of flight but do it repeatedly with minimal refurbishment. A good portion of this heat could be kept away from the aircraft skin with a blunt body design, which creates a rounded bow shock wave with a layer of insulating lower pressure air between the vehicle and the shock wave, reducing heat transfer rates. For this reason, the space shuttle surface is carefully molded to take advantage of this phenomenon. The rounded nose cross section gradually transitions to a blunted triangle, minimizing the heat reaching the less protected side wall of the shuttle, which used lower temperature insulation. We are now seven minutes into the re-entry procedure, having descended 50 kilometers in altitude but only shedding 0.5 kilometers per second off our velocity. We have entered the period of maximum re-entry heat, a confluence of speed and atmospheric density. The layer of superheated plasma surrounding the shuttle is blocking communication to the computers and astronauts inside, a result of free electrons in the plasma interfering with electromagnetic communication techniques. This problem would last for the next 12 minutes. For now, the shuttle is operating on its own telemetry data, ensuring that a 40-degree angle of attack is maintained. Managing that angle with a velocity of 6.5 km per second was no easy task. A massive control surface was needed, the elevons on the outer wing would not suffice. This is where the rear body flap came into play. It was a massive control surface underneath the shuttle's main engines, covered in high-temperature insulation. The body flap doubled as a heat shield for the shuttle's main engines. With no cooling liquid hydrogen running through the nozzle, the flap was needed to shield the engines from the heat of re-entry. On the space shuttle's third flight, the Kuiper Airborne Observatory flew underneath the orbiter as it re-entered and captured an infrared image of its searing hot belly, an experimental program to validate NASA's newly developed computational calculations and experimental testing. The nose and leading edges were a scorching 1,500 degrees Celsius, far beyond what the aluminum airframe underneath is capable of enduring. These leading edges, experiencing the hottest temperatures, needed the most heat-resistant material on the entire shuttle, a reinforced carbon-carbon composite. This amazing material was created in the years between the development of the X-15 and the space shuttle. A carbon composite is manufactured with a special post-processing step. Initially, it is manufactured like any other carbon fiber part, a carbon fiber weave molded into shape and bound together with a resin. However, the heat of re-entry would set the hydrocarbon resin on fire without special treatment. The post-processing step solves this problem by placing the carbon composite in a vacuum chamber and heating it, causing the hydrocarbon resin to decompose and releasing the hydrogens, leaving layers of pure carbon behind, graphite. Carbon fibers are bound together by a maze of graphite, making it strong and capable of withstanding 1,510 degrees Celsius. They face head-on into the inferno of hypersonic flight. The leading edge of the orbiter's wings is composed of 22 of these carbon-carbon panels, with ceiling strips covering expansion gaps between each panel, an essential solution to a lesson hard one during the development of the X-15. To investigate the heat of hypersonic flight, the X-15 was painted with a special kind of paint that reacts to heat. After one flight, the X-15 returned with strange wedge-shaped patterns emanating from the leading edge expansion joints. These small gaps in the leading edge allowed the superheated plasma to flow inside the aircraft structure, 
rapidly causing erosion and melting. These findings resulted in the sealed design we see on the Space Shuttle. The leading edge panels connect to the aluminum structure using Inconel X fasteners and are bolted to a titanium heat shield, protecting the frame and wings. Further reducing the heat load of the orbiter was a complex series of rolls and sweeping S-shaped turns. The high angle of attack, in combination with these turns, reduced the orbiter's speed and spread the heat load over a wider area. By rolling left and right, the orbiter maximized the effective surface area facing the direction of travel, shedding speed at a much greater rate and spreading the heat across the bottom of the wings. These turns were pre-programmed, with some controlled by astronauts once radio communication was restored. We are now 13 minutes into the re-entry sequence, and communication is now restored. The orbiter's speed is 5.3 km per second, still 15 times the speed of sound, and temperatures are slowly reducing, now a measly 1,200 degrees Celsius. The orbiter is now reaching the altitudes where the lower temperature thermal protection system materials can survive the heat of re-entry.